why we age and how to slow or reverse the effects of aging, you will have in-depth knowledge about the biology of aging, which is that aging is not the normal and natural consequence that we all will suffer, but rather that aging is a disease that can be slowed or halted. You're going to learn a tremendous amount of information and practical tools that you can apply in your everyday life. Why is it that having elevated blood sugar, glucose, and insulin ages us more quickly? And or why is it that having periods of time each day or perhaps longer can extend our lifespan? Let's start with what I think was a big mistake, was the idea that people should never be hungry. We live in a world now where there's at least three meals a day. So the feeling of hunger, some people never experience hunger in their whole lives. It's really, really bad for them. What we actually found, my colleagues and I, is that when you look at animals, whether it's a dog or a mouse or a monkey, the ones that live the longest, 30% longer and stay healthy, are the ones that don't eat all the time. If you have low levels of insulin and another molecule called insulin-like growth factor, those low levels turn on the longevity genes. And But by having high levels of insulin, all day, being fed means your longevity genes are not switched on. Your clock is ticking faster by always being fed. It's not as important what you eat, it's when you eat during the day. What is your protocol for when to eat and when to avoid food? Well, if there's one thing I I could say, definitely try to skip a meal a day. That's the best thing. Does it matter which meal or are they essentially equivalent? Well, as long as it's at the end or the beginning of the day. Well, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I, I skip breakfast and then I go throughout the whole day as I'm doing right now here with this glass of water here. I'm just keeping myself filled with liquids and so I don't feel hungry. Beware that the first two to three weeks when you try that, you will feel hungry and you also have a habit of wanting to chew on something. But try to make it through the first three weeks and do without breakfast or do without dinner and you'll get through it. Our society is built on comfort. We've got, most countries have enough food and shelter. Uh, We can sit down. We don't have to run away from predators very often. And this is a real problem because these longevity defenses that normally would be activated by being cold and hungry and running are lethargic. The body doesn't expend energy to defend itself unless there's a need for it. And modern society is the worst thing. We we love comfort. It feels good. But that's the worst thing for long-term health. We need to trick the body into getting out of its comfort zone by doing these things we've talked about. Eating the right foods, eating less often. And as long as we have adequate nutrition, that's what we call it intermittent fasting, that allows the body to turn on these defenses without suffering long-term negative consequences. What's interesting, I find, is that even though we know the fridge is probably full with food, our bodies are not that smart. Our bodies don't get that message and we can trick it, trick the body into thinking, oh my goodness, the fridge is running out of food or the field or the forest is lacking in food. We better get to hunger down and survive. What are those things? You burn fat, you increase your metabolism. So you've got more energy to run around and find food. You become more alert because you've got to go find more food and you defend your body against insults, whether it's incoming infections or diseases from within. And that's cool that we can trick our bodies. And it's not that hard. We just need to do the things we're talking about. I've heard you say you eat mostly plants, but a little bit of fish or chicken or something of that sort or eggs or... um... First thing I would go for would be... So a dark green leafy vegetable. Uh, so that would be, yeah, kale or, or anything. I think baby um, broccoli is good. All that good leafy stuff. I also would do bro- Brussels sprouts. Then I would go and I'd get, I get fruit. I, I'm not averse to fruit. It's a nice snack in between. So I'm pretty good on, on apples, but I don't go for a really sugar laden fruit. I also eat um, beans and things. Um, I went almost completely to plants and my body has responded. I look better. I think my skin is better. I feel better. My memory is certainly better. You just look at those populations and people that live a long time, they are generally smaller women who don't eat much, who eat vegetarian. I mean, that's the fact. But is that specifically to avoid excessive amino acid intake or is it something specific about plants that that excites you with respect to? (laughs) I mean, vegetables are delicious too, but what is it? Is it something great about plants or is it something bad about, when I think of meat, I guess the biologist in me thinks amino acids, right? Well, there are two good things about plants. um, And Neither of them is taste for me. Um, I would eat steak all the time if I could. I did when I was a kid, I'm an Australian. But plants have two benefits. One is that they're highly nutritious and they'll give you a lot of the the vitamins and and nutrients that I need. I don't take a multivitamin. I don't wanna have the excess iron in my body. So there's that high density nutrition. So those dark leaves, if it's a spinach salad, great. The second is that there is what's called xenohermetic molecules in plants. That term xenohermesis is a term that I came up with uh, with uh, my friend Conrad Howitz, which means stressed plants make molecules that benefit your health. 
I'll break it down. Xeno means between species and hormesis is the term, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger and live longer. So what are the other things that anyone and everyone can do, should do to live longer? I think most people don't appreciate is that exercise isn't just beneficial for your fitness and for your vitality. It actually can stop diseases in their tracks. Um, exercise can slow down cancer. In fact, it can prevent up to 23% of all cancers from occurring. Um, that's true for cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has an even bigger effect on that. 30% reduction just by doing moderate exercise every week. 50 minutes is, is sufficient or three times a week with 10 minutes. All cause mortality. Mortality is basically slowing down aging. That's a 27% reduction in the rate of aging just by exercising. You can measure biological age now in people. I could take one of your cells, Matt, back to my lab and we can measure the rate of your aging. It's called the Horvath clock or DNA methylation clock. And when you look at people that have lived a healthy lifestyle, say they've been exercising for the last 30 years, they are much younger epigenetically, according to this clock, than someone who hasn't. So that tells us that very likely that exercise is not just protecting you against cardiovascular disease, it's slowing down your overall rate of aging. I've heard you talk before about some of the prime movers for longevity and all risk mortality. And I'd love for you to review a little bit of that for us. I think we all know that we shouldn't smoke because it's very likely that we'll die earlier. Smoking is approximately a 40% increase in the risk of ACM. What does that translate to? And that means I'm I'm shortening my life by 40%? No, it means at any point in time, there's a 40% great, greater risk that you're going to die relative to a non-smoker and Got a never smoker. High blood pressure. It's about a 20 to 25% increase in all-cause mortality. What's the underlying condition that leads you to that? It's, you know, profound hypertension, you know, significant type 2 diabetes that's been uncontrolled. You know, that's enormous. That's about 175% increase in ACM. So now the question is like, how do you improve? So what are the things that improve those? So now here we do this by comparing low to high achievers and other metrics. So if you look at low muscle mass versus high muscle mass, what is the improvement? And it's pretty significant. It's about 3x. So if you compare low muscle mass people to high muscle mass people as they age, the low muscle mass people have about a 3x hazard ratio or a 200% increase in all-cause mortality. And when you start to tease out strength, you can realize that strength could be probably 3.5x as a hazard ratio, meaning about 250% greater risk if you have low strength to high strength. If you look at people who are in the bottom 25% for their age and sex in terms of VO2 max, and you compare them to the people that are just at the 50th to 75th percentile, um, you're talking about a 2x difference roughly in, um, in, in, in the risk of ACM. If you compare the bottom 25% to the top 2.5%, so you're talking about you know bottom quarter to the elite for a given age, um, you're talking about 5x, wow. 400% difference in all-cause mortality. That's probably the single strongest association I've seen for any modifiable behavior. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the specifics around the training to get into the um, you know, top two tiers there, because it seems that those are enormous positive effects of cardiovascular exercise. Until your VO2 max is at least at the 75th percentile and you're able to wall sit for at least two and you're able to dead hang for at least a minute, I think we have a minute and a half is the goal for a 40 year old woman, two minutes is the goal for a 40 year old man. So we adjust them up and down based on uh, age and gender. We could rattle off a bunch of relatively low hanging fruit I wish there was a rule that said like you couldn't talk about anything else. If you do the right things during your life and start at an early age, let's say 25, start eating the kind of diets that I talked about, I think that we should all aim to at least reach a century. I'm a little bit behind. I was born too early to benefit the most from all of this discovery. Those of you who are in your 20s, you should definitely aim to reach 100. I don't see why not. Consider this. This is really important. The average lifespan of a human that looks after themselves and but doesn't pay attention is about 80, okay? Japan, that's the average age for a male, a bit higher. If you do the right things in your life, which is uh, eat healthy food, don't overeat, don't become obese, do a bit of exercise, get good sleep and don't stress, that gives you on average 14 extra years. That gets you to 94. So getting to 100, if you just focus on what I'm talking about, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So what's the maximum? Well, we know that one human made it to 122 and a number of them make it into their teens. I think that's also the next level of, of where we can get to with the types of technologies that I'm talking about. Medicines like I mentioned rapamycin, there's one called metformin, which is the diabetes drug, which I take. That in combination with these lifestyle changes should get us beyond 100. How long can we ultimately live? Well, there's no maximum 
limit to human lifespan. Why can a whale live 300 years, but we cannot? 